Grace is greater. Hebrews chapter 12, verse 15 says, See to it that no one misses the grace of God, and that no bitter root grows up to cause trouble and defile many. Grace. God's riches at Christ's expense. Sometimes it's overlooked. Sometimes it's minimalized. It's quite often it's understood, misunderstood. <clears throat> this morning we're going to begin a series on grace. This isn't just any series on grace. This is a series on that we're going to look at is going to help us to see how grace is greater. How grace is greater than our sin. How grace is greater than our brokenness. How grace is greater than our regrets. There's many other aspects in life that we're going to look at and we're going to see how God's grace is so much greater than anything that we can experience. And Keith Eidelman wrote, the grace is not a new, new word to us. It's familiar, and that can be a problem. When you're using a word that's been around for a long time and has been talked about frequently, people tend to yawn. The word grace is, no, is so common that it doesn't feel very amazing. I remember a Kellogg's Corn Flakes commercial that came out when I was a kid. And man, he's a little bit older than I am, so... Uh, I'm not really sure when he was a kid. Uh, apparently, the people at Kellogg's did some research and found out that a lot of their potent, potent, potential customers had grown up eating Kellogg's Corn Flakes, but had not purchased a box in recent years. So they came up with a campaign slogan that went like this. Kellogg's Corn Flakes. Taste them again for the first time. Maybe of you remember that commercial? I don't. I was too young for that. <laughs> They wanted to reintroduce people to their products, so they invited them to try Kellogg's Corn Flakes as if they never had before. He goes on to say, I know many of you have heard countless sermons about grace. You may have even read a number of books about grace. But my prayer is that you would see this word again for the first time. He has a point here, because sometimes we'll take something, be it grace or even salvation or forgiveness, and many of the biblical terms that we use and we just use them and we don't even think about it. That's just part of our everyday conversation. And then somebody comes up to us and what does that mean exactly? And we're not able to explain it to them to the extent that we should be able to explain it to them. So hopefully this series will help open our hearts and our minds to help us to better understand and experience grace in a way like we've never understood or experienced grace before. Hopefully this series helps us to be able to make sure that no one misses the grace of God. To make sure that, as we read in our opening scripture, that no bitter root can grow up within our hearts that causes problems in our lives, in our homes, in our relationships, and in our church. Helping us to understand God's grace is going to help us to offer that same grace and forgiveness to others. We're going to have more on that in the coming weeks. How do we offer the grace and forgiveness that God has given us to others? But this morning, we're going to talk about grace is greater than our sin. Boy, well, we all sin. It's just a fact of life. It's a fact of Scripture. Romans chapter 3, verse 23 says, For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. In order for us to understand grace, we have to understand that fact. We have to examine ourselves. Take a hard look at ourselves. The reason for that is because a lot of times we will minimize sin in our minds. When we minimize sin, we also minimize grace. Once we realize that we have sinned, we can begin to realize the power of grace. 
Understanding just how bad our sin is helps us to better understand just how great God's grace is. Now for some reason, in our culture, we tend to classify sin. We tend to say that, that one sin is worse than the other. And they sound worse. You know, uh, murder sounds a whole lot worse than somebody stealing a candy bar, doesn't it? It just does. It sounds worse. So essentially what we're saying is we're saying that the murderer needs more grace than the thief. But when we look at what we just read, all have sinned and fell short. There is no level of sin. All sin, no matter how big or sm how small it appears to us, it is still sin. And it's sin that causes us to miss the glory of God. See, when we minimize sin, and we think that it's not as bad to do something as it is to do something else, a lot of times we'll put sin in our own standards. Sometimes we'll tell somebody that we're going to be there to do something and then not show up. We can't even live up to our own standards. And if we can't live up to our own standards, how can we live up to God's standards? But again, that's where grace comes in. We cannot understand the power of grace until we understand the deepness of our failures. Until we understand the consequences for our sin. Well, what are those consequences? In Romans chapter 6, the first half of verse 23, it tells us, For the wages of sin is death. Now, this doesn't classify sin anywhere in here either. It says the wages of sin, all sin. The consequence is death. No matter how big we think it is or how small we think it is, the consequences of sin is death. Spiritual death. Eternal separation from God. When we begin to realize that, we begin to realize the depth of sin. We begin to realize the destruction that even our smallest sin can have over our lives. We begin to, we begin to realize that the idea of, I'm not really that bad, is just the way that we minimize sin. And remember, minimizing our sin minimizes God's grace that we experience. Now, the wages of sin is death, and all sin leads to death. Understanding that helps us to better understand grace. Now, hearing that we all sin and we all fall short of God's glory, we all deserve death, is not something that we want to hear. It's not something that we want to focus on. It's not something that makes us feel good. It's not very uplifting. But hearing that we sin and we fall short of the glory of God, hearing that we deserve death helps us to better understand just how great the grace of God is. Until we realize the seriousness of our sin, we can't realize the power of God's grace. Understanding and experience, experiencing God's grace begins with us understanding the seriousness of our sin. Well, it's not comforted, comforting to be confronted with our sin. It's not comfortable to hear about how much our sin can cost. It is comforting to hear just how much greater God's grace is than our sin. And God's grace began with the sacrifice of Jesus Christ because Jesus died to rescue us from our sin. 1 Timothy chapter 1, verse 15 says, Here is a trustworthy saying that deserves full acceptance. Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners of whom I am the worst. Paul told Timothy, and he tells us today that what he's about to say is 
one of the most trustworthy <coughs> things that we can find in Scripture. That it deserves full acceptance, no doubt, leaving no doubt in our minds that Jesus Christ came to save sinners. The reason that Jesus stepped off of His throne in heaven, became one of us here on this earth, He had one goal, and that was to save sinners. Well, save sinners or not? Well, remember, we just looked at we've all sinned and fell short of God's glory, causing us to deserve death. Christ came to save us from our sin and remove the penalty of death from our lives. And that is the beginning, just the beginning of the good news of grace. But I want, to, I want us to make that last part of the scripture, I want us to make it personal as, which, as Paul did. Paul said, sinners of whom I am the worst. He didn't say that he was the worst, meaning referring back to his persecution of Christians before his conversion. He was saying, today, right here, as I live and breathe, as I write this letter, I am the worst of all sinners. He didn't focus on his past. He focused on his current state. And in order for us to fully understand grace, we need to realize that we are no better off than any other sinner. We are the worst sinner that we know. I am the worst sinner that I know. You are the worst sinner that you know. That doesn't sound very exciting, does it? But under, understanding that will help us to better understand the power of God's grace. A grace that is a result of God's love. Romans chapter 5 verse 8 says, But God demonstrated His own love for us in this. While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. See, God loves us so much that while we were still sinners, that while we were still rejecting His love, He sent His Son to die for us. Our sin cost Jesus His life. Our sin cost God His Son. God's love for us caused Him to send Christ to pay the price for our sin, the price of death. That is the good news of grace. When we talk about grace, we are receiving God's riches. We're receiving the opportunity to be in His presence, to experience all the wonderful things that heaven has to offer. All the things that we talk about receiving and experiencing on that day when we go to meet our Lord and Savior was possible, is possible, at the expense of Christ who suffered and died for us. When we minimize sin, we minimize the high price that Christ paid for us. And when we minimize that grace, we minimize what comes along with it, and that's God's riches. God's grace, God's grace can only be experience to its fullest when we think, as Paul did, that we are the worst sinner that we know. When we understand that, only then can we understand the mightiness, the power of God's grace. When we understand the seriousness of our sins, when we understand the high price that was paid for our sin, only then can we understand that grace is greater than our sin. A few minutes ago, we looked at Romans chapter 3, verse 23, which said that we all fall short. We all sin. 
There's a verse that follows that. Romans chapter 3, verse 24, that gives us the good news. It says, and are justified freely by His grace through the redemption that came by Christ Jesus. It didn't say but are. It says we all sin, we all fall short, and we are justified. What does justified mean? It means it's just as if I had never sinned. And the best news about that is it's free. I don't have to pay anything for it. I don't have to do anything to earn it. It's given to me for free. It's given to you for free. And it's given to us by the grace of God. It's given to us as a wonderful <coughs> gift. While it's free for us, it costs Jesus his life on a cross. It cost him a lot of physical and spiritual agony. It caused him a temporary separation from God. But because of that, he redeems us. And he offers us his grace. He offers us God's riches. He offers us justification. And He does it for free. We can't earn it. Remember Romans 6.23 that says, For the wages of sin is death. The second half of that says, But the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. If the wages of sin is death and Christ paid that price and God offers His grace for free, He's giving us a gift. The gift of eternal life in His presence. Therefore, we see that grace is greater than and then our sin because Jesus overcame our sin. Jesus paid the penalty for our sin. See, if our sin causes us to deserve death, and Christ's sacrifice removes that penalty, that tells us that, our, that God's grace is greater than our sin. And only something that is greater than the other can take the other's place. Since God's grace is greater than our sin, it takes the place of sin in our lives. Romans chapter 5, verses 1 and 2 says, Therefore, since we have been justified through faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have gained access to by faith into this grace in which we now stand. And we rejoice in the hope of the glory of God. See, since grace is greater than our sin, since it is just as if we've never sinned, it removes any barrier between us and God. It gives us peace with God. It's through our faith in Christ, the one who paid the penalty for our sin, that we can have that peace with God. Because Christ paid the price and we've been given the free gift of grace. Because we have peace with God, we can rejoice in the hope that we will see and we will experience the glory of God face to face firsthand. Because grace is greater than our sin. We can look forward to that day when we experience that wonderful glory of our Lord and Savior. You see, when we get to heaven, 
It's going to be 1% us, 100% grace. Now we have a math teacher in the church, and he can tell you very quickly that my math does not add up. Because 100% plus 1% is 101%. So what does that tell you? That tells you it's 0% me, and it's 100% grace that gets me in the gates of heaven to experience the glory of God. It's not me. It's not anything that I can do. Because I sure don't deserve it. I sure can't earn it. But because of His love, He gives us His grace. Romans chapter 5, verses 22, 22, 21 through 22. I'll get it out in a minute. <laughs> It says the law was added so that the trespass might increase. But when sin increased, grace increased all the more. So that just as sin reigned in death, so also grace might reign through righteousness to bring eternal life through Jesus, through Christ Jesus our Lord. It says we better understand the seriousness of our sin which is described in the law, we better understand and can better experience the power of God's grace. See, grace, we can explain grace all day long. What does it mean? Where does it come from? We can explain it all day long, but until we actually experience it, we're not going to fully understand it. By examining ourselves using God's law, we can see just how short we fall of His expectations. Just how serious our sin is. By knowing how serious our sin is, which brings death, we can experience how great God's grace is. Only by understanding that grace is increased in our lives every day. And when all is said and done, that grace will bring us eternal life. Can we understand how we are made righteous in the eyes of God? As our understanding of sin increases, so does our understanding of grace. So does our understanding that Christ paid the ultimate price in order for us to experience God's grace to its fullest. Hearing that we all stand and we all fall short of God's glory can be disheartening. And if that's all we hear, we're not hearing the full truth of the gospel. It's not until we hear that our sin is not the greatest thing that we can experience do we begin to understand grace. But understanding our sin helps us to better understand grace. This morning we've looked at how serious our sin is. Our sin is so serious, no matter how big or how small we think it is, the penalty is death. All sins lead to the same penalty. However, the greatest news that we can get about our sin is that grace, God's grace, Christ, God's riches at Christ's expense is greater than our sin. To us, God's gift of grace is free, but it costs Jesus his life. This morning, I Pray that everyone will better understand grace through this series. This morning, understand that grace is greater than our sin. I pray that everybody this morning will be able to experience the grace and the greatness of God's grace like they never have before. No matter how dark life can get, no, how, no matter how bad we can feel, Remember what Paul told us to think. God's grace 
is greater than our sin. There is no sin that we could ever commit that is greater than God's grace. This morning, is there something that you're holding on to that you just can't forgive yourself for? You just can't let it go. Maybe something you did yesterday, maybe something you did 20, 30 years ago. You're just holding on to it. This morning, give it to God. Accept His grace. Walk in His grace. Maybe there's something that somebody's done to you and you can't forgive. Give it to God. Take His grace. See, when we confess our sin, God forgives us. He justifies us. He redeems us. And He gives us His grace. So this morning, walk, accept the grace of God. And realize that no matter what you've done, God's grace is greater than our sin.